This is a podcast by The Straits Times. Welcome to the Invisible Asia podcast, a series in which The Straits Times casts the spotlight on little seen or talked about segments of society across the region. I'm your narrator, Janning Tan. South Korea's Muslim Minority Song Bora goes everywhere in her hijab. She's South Korean and is a Muslim convert. So she dons the Islamic headscarf, also known as the Tudong, before heading out each day. In a country where there are few Muslims, not to mention Korean Muslims, she stands out in a crowd. Sometimes people stare at her, but staying true to her beliefs is far more important to her than fitting in with the masses. Bora remembers vividly how she felt the first time she wore the hijab out in public around 2007, shortly after she converted to Islam. She says, Everyone was staring at me in my hijab. I felt so shy. I ended up going to hide in a public toilet in a subway station. I waited until the crowd dispersed before I dared to come out. 14 years on, Bora is no longer as self-conscious as she was back then. She now lives and works in Itaewon, South Korea's most multicultural district in the heart of Seoul, where it's a little more common to see hijab-wearing Muslim women on the streets. That has certainly helped put her more at ease. But she is still regularly bombarded by friends, and sometimes even strangers, with questions about her choice of headwear. Korean people always ask me why I wear the hijab. They think it is used to control women and that we are pressured to wear it. Bora, who is in her 30s, converted to Islam only after years of reading up about the core tenets of the religion and finding that they resonated deeply with her. The manager at the Korea Islam Business and Cultural Centre is among a small but growing group of Korean Muslims, numbering about 35,000. According to the Korean Muslim Federation, as many as 3,000 South Koreans convert to Islam each year. South Korea is home to only about 200,000 Muslims in all, barely 0.4% of the population. Most of them are workers and students from countries like Turkey, Pakistan and Uzbekistan. But a lack of understanding of Islam among the country's general populace contributes to the discrimination that Muslims in South Korea face for their belief. For example, Bora says, in South Korea, the hijab is often viewed as a symbol of terrorism. Ever so often, she gets asked if she supports the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, and if she has ever met members of the terrorist organization known in short as ISIS. I'd laugh first, then explain that not all Muslims support ISIS and Taliban, and tell them that we want to live peacefully. Esau, another Muslim convert, confesses that she was shocked when she first found out that her Malaysian husband was Muslim, as she was under the misconception that Muslims were terrorists. The couple first met seven years ago at a social gathering in Seoul, and they had become friends before he finally told her about his religion. She says, I thought to myself, how can this nice and funny guy, who graduated from Korea University and works at Samsung, be a terrorist? But all the news, articles and blogs I found on Naver mentioned only the bad side of Islam. Eventually, though, Esau found more objective descriptions of Islam by googling in English and from learning more about the religion through interactions with her newfound friend. Romance blossomed along the way, finding out about the principles and concepts of the Islamic faith at a time when she was questioning her own existence also helped her to better understand the religion. In time, she too decided to become a Muslim. But her conversion also brought with it some difficulties. Even now, after my conversion, I'm still not ready yet to don my hijab every day. 
I will wear the hijab in Malaysia because no one will disturb me. But in Korea, people might attack me. They might pull my hijab off, tell me I'm crazy, scold me, swear at me, or say things like, just be a normal Korean if you are Korean. I'm not ready for that. I'm not so brave. So, if I need to wear the hijab out, I'd speak English only, so that Korean people will think I'm a foreigner. It's easier that way. You're listening to the Invisible Asia podcast series. Do check out previous episodes in our Invisible Asia playlist link provided in the podcast text description below. Like us and give us a rating. Now, back to our Invisible Asia series. The South Korean government has been working to change its people's mindset about Islam in recent years. As the popularity of Korean dramas and K-pop music drew growing hordes of Muslim tourists into the country before the coronavirus pandemic hit. About a million Muslim tourists visited South Korea in 2019. Muslims follow strict religious dietary laws that dictate the ways their food should be prepared and forbid them from eating types of food such as pork. There's a growing global market that caters to such needs. Food that is permissible for Muslim consumption is labelled as halal. The halal food market alone was worth 1.9 trillion US dollars in 2020. That's about 2.5 trillion Singapore dollars, while the halal cosmetics market is valued at some 39 billion US dollars. Both figures are expected to rise further in the coming years, and the South Korean government is keen to tap on this expanding market. But impressions are hard to change. Yu Hongzong, a 62-year-old Muslim convert who runs IT, the country's first halal-certified Korean restaurant in Seoul, recalls how the government tried to implement an Islamic finance system in 2012 to bring in money from oil-rich countries, but failed due to fierce opposition from Christian lawmakers. Some years later, it tried to transform South Korea into a halal hub to woo more Muslim tourists, but also faced strong objection from Christians and Buddhist groups. Hong Zhong blames the local media for misrepresenting Islam in their coverage. Many Koreans associate the religion with terrorism because of a 2007 incident in which members of the Taliban captured 23 South Korean missionaries in Afghanistan and executed two of them, before the South Korean government reached a deal to secure their release. The saga dominated headlines in South Korea for weeks, creating a lasting negative impression on the religion in the country. Hong Dong says, People just don't want Islamization to happen in Korea. Now, when the Christians came to Korea, they spread their faith through charity work, building schools, and hospitals, and grew to become a very powerful force in society. So Korean people, they think Christians are good people because they did a lot for us. But Korean people are biased against Islam because of what they see in the media, like war and instability in Iraq and Afghanistan. Because of that, the first thing Koreans know about Islam is terrorism. Hong Zhong has noticed a slight softening in people's attitudes more recently, though, which he credits to the current government's focus on deepening engagement with Southeast Asia. South Koreans are only now starting to realize that Islam is a way of life, not just in the Middle East, but also across Southeast Asia, he says. And Southeast Asia has for years been the most popular travel destination for South Koreans. Hong Zhong and his family converted to Islam in 2014, influenced by his eldest son who had studied the Arabic language and Islamic finance and converted to the religion nine years earlier. That same year, he opened his halal restaurant to cater to Muslim students, workers and tourists who want to have Korean food with the assurance that they aren't going against the religion's dietary laws. 
Buoyed by his restaurant's instant success at home, Hong Zhong expanded abroad from 2016, opening four branches in Muslim-dominated Malaysia, where two of his sons now live and where the popularity of Korean dramas and K-pop music have spawned a huge craze for halal Korean cuisine. There's very strong demand for halal Korean food. I have many Singaporean customers, and they have asked me to open a branch in Singapore too. Many young Korean Muslims have in recent years also taken to social media to share their experiences with Muslims abroad, as well as to raise awareness about Islam with the locals, with some success. 32-year-old Isol today runs a YouTube channel with her husband, Muhammad Khalid bin Ismail. Their channel, Kim Chi Budo, which is linked to their Muslim travel agency of the same name, has nearly 48,000 subscribers. Each video they produce can rack up as many as hundreds of thousands of views. Kim Chi Budu's mission is to help Muslim tourists navigate South Korea to find halal food and praying spaces more easily. They also have tutorials on how to prepare halal Korean cuisine. Because of the global travel restrictions due to the pandemic, the couple has since shifted focus. They now provide consulting services in halal tourism, such as advising government officials on how to deal with the needs of Muslim people in the country and how to make South Korea a more Muslim-friendly place for all. Esol says, As local Muslims here, we know how to blend the Korean way with the Muslim lifestyle. My husband has lived here for 14 years. Just before we got married in 2017, I converted to Islam. At first, my family was worried that I would have a hard time because of the rules like having to pray five times a day, fasting during Ramadan, and abstaining from pork and alcohol. But I was determined to share my husband's values and lifestyle. Songbora, too, is something of a social media influencer, with nearly 200,000 followers on Instagram. Bora says the driving force for her presence on social media is to promote mutual understanding between Korean Muslims and non-Muslims, as well as to help foreign Muslims understand South Korea better. In seeking to communicate the harmony that can exist between her nationality and religion, she often posts pictures of herself dressed in a traditional hanbok costume and a matching hijab. Her fusion fashion style has earned her many compliments, but also some flack. One hater on my Instagram once commented, I'm sure you'll wear a bomb jacket one day. This is all just a misunderstanding of my religion. You've been listening to Invisible Asia. This episode is on South Korea's Muslim minority. And I'm your narrator, Janing Tan. Do check out the full story by Chang Mei Chun and The Straits Times. We have a link in our podcast text description below. And don't forget to subscribe to The Straits Times podcast channel on your favourite audio apps, Apple Podcasts, Spotify or Google Podcasts. That was an SBH podcast by The Straits Times. Find us on Spotify, Apple or Google Podcasts or streaming on Google Home. Do feedback to us at podcast.sbh.com.sg. You can also check out more podcasts on various topics at The Straits Times, The Business Times and Money FM 89.3.